Hello, welcome back everyone. Uh, our next speaker is a designer and maker who has invented holographic user interfaces, designed electric skateboards for cats, and even created his own light field camera. He worked as a design lead for Microsoft's augmented reality uh, headset, the HoloLens, and currently leads Aero, Adobe's mobile AR app for creatives. In his spare time, he creates short films using abstract effects and unique filming hardware. His talk this year takes us through experience building cameras for the immersive future. Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Kim Pimmel. Hello. Has everyone had their coffee? Got some energy back? Yeah, all right. So, hi, I'm Kim. Uh, this is me, 10 years old, with a family camera. It's a Yashica 35 millimeter, so old school film, you know, the physical stuff before we just had cameras in our pockets. Uh, I think most of you will remember that. Uh, and I'm a camera geek, so uh, I've been using cameras for over 30 years and enjoy using lots of different types of cameras. Uh, as I got older, from point and shoot here with a f questionable rave attire, um, to uh, more fancier 35 millimeter with nicer optics that I you know, bought on eBay. And then uh, in my college years, uh, my first uh, nicer Canon DSLR that my wife got for me. Uh, thank you. Uh, and all, all this time learning and experimenting about uh, cameras and learning how they work and getting better at shooting, how to frame, uh, something that was good for me was uh, not having a lot of money, so it really forced me to sort of have a one-shot, one-kill mentality where I would like spend a lot of time framing an image and less time just shooting a lot of pictures so I could really hone how to take pictures, uh, whether it be on a medium format later in life or a 35 millimeter or a point and shoot. There's one camera in particular that really sparked my interest and this is a stereo realist from the 50s and this thing is a 3D camera, shoots on 35 millimeter film and interleaves the stereo frames on a piece of 35 millimeter uh, film. And you get uh, these side-by-side -side, uh, stereo frames like this and this was shot on a, on a camping trip. Um, and when you flip them, or look at it through a 3D viewer, you get this kind of 3D effect. So you get the 3D visual, right? Um, so it feels like you're a bit more there, you get a sense of the volume. Uh, they're, they're just kind of fun. Um, you could see it through those old school, you know, like Viewmaster slide things or a stereo viewer. It really caught my attention. I like exploring new ways to see, and this was really a neat way as someone who was learning about photography to uh, see in new ways. Uh, I also like playing with lenses, so uh, macro lenses are also really interesting, so this is a feather up close. Uh, and also not just capturing uh, things that I've found, but also creating new imagery. So this is uh, a mishmash of like, Elmer's glue and food dye and printer toner uh, and soap and then letting it dry and then you kind of create these 3D structures that up close in macro scale just look really interesting. So I took these photos and took my photography and started doing frame by frame animations and making videos from them and they uh, actually got some traction online and really spurred me to, to do more. So this is uh, bubbles with ferrofluid passing through fluid dynamics and liquids, and just playing with abstraction and visuals that tell a story through, through powerful imagery. I've also explored light painting, so that's leaving the shutter open on your camera, and then waving lights in front of it, and it captures the path of the, the light over time. And so you'll get from this type of motion something that's really graceful and soft like this or you can capture geometry with overlapping colors like this. It's very flat and 2D. Uh, also played a lot around with uh, making it volumetric. So this is kind of one of the vessel series that I made. So this is using a Technics 1200 turntable in a very unusual way, putting lights on top of a record player and spinning them around. Uh, started playing with this technique combined with Arduinos and electronics and servos to have them move while spinning on the turntable to get results like this. So this was a short film that I made. Well, uh, online, and a lot of people liked it and, and viewed it in 
got a staff pick on Vimeo. And at the time that I was working on this and sort of taking the talk about this video, Adobe, and I was combining my passion for computers and photography, uh, working on this app called Revel at the time, which was basically like Google Photos, but from Adobe. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but uh, it, was, it was really exciting to be working on this kind of uh, intersection of, of my two interests, computers and photography. Um, and so uh, while I was on that team, uh, the creative director from uh, Microsoft reached out and he said, me to move to Seattle, San Francisco, and I said, that sounds really intriguing after lots of interviews, a very uh, mysterious but it ended up being this, which is the HoloLens, uh, which is a head-mounted augmented reality computer. This is me wearing it. And so basically this is, you know, putting uh, virtual things into the real world, uh, the first type of computer like this in, uh, around, commercially available. And so I worked on the operating system, uh, the start menu, how it appears, the gesture. Uh, the team did a lot of work around how to manipulate objects in space and move them and place them on physical surfaces. So you're combining the, the physical and the digital here. And this was you know, pretty early days for AR and VR. Um, the Oculus Rift dev kit hadn't, had I think it had just come out around the same time. So this was a brand new medium that people were still learning about. And in terms of my interest with cameras, there was another product that came out around the same time. So this is the, the Ricoh Theta S, which is a 360 camera. So this is one of the first 360 cameras. And basically, it has uh, this really big wide angle lens on both sides of the camera and captures a 360 sphere. I'm sure you've most, most of you are familiar with that. Um, and that was cool. You could like scroll around on your web browser and like look at different angles of the image. But it really worked well with this product, which is the Oculus Rift Dev Kit, um, that came out around the same time, and let you see the world kind of like around you, right? Like you're inside of it, and that's not a big surprise new thing today. But back in you know the mid 2010s, it was uh, pretty innovative and new. So that was cool. You could like be inside this photo sphere and look all around. But something that was missing for me, as you saw in my images, I, I like to focus on a subject, right? Like when we take a picture, if I take a picture of the, the crowd here, I'm gonna point my camera this way, and I'm gonna frame you over here, right? I'm not gonna point my camera this way and hope that you look over, like, look over there. So one of the challenges with 360 content is sort of providing context and framing and a directorial view on what you want to show, right? Uh, you can't control the, the person's physical turning away from your subject. And so I was curious, could you get something like this, the feeling of being immersed and being inside the image, which this kind of does for you, right? Like, it gives you a little bit of a sense of feeling like you're inside the image. And I was curious, could you do something that's similar to this where you frame a, a subject and really provide uh, a vision on what you want to show the viewer? And so I started thinking about John Gaeta's work from uh, uh, ILM. And he worked on the bullet time from the matrix. And uh, that's basically a massive array of cameras that are spread around the set. And you've got uh, Keanu Reeves here doing his, his thing. And you're just switching from camera to camera. And you get this kind of like the bullet time effect, right? Like we're probably all familiar with that. Um, and so I was like, well, could I take the whole idea of a 360, uh, sorry, a 3D image where instead of just having two frames, having more than one frame, basically like creating a horizontal rail, something that I could carry around. So that was kind of a design goal for me was to make a portable camera that I could bring to places. So I started on a project that I knew nothing about how to make hardware or didn't knew little about electronics. And uh, I just dove in by getting some rails, right? You want to make a linear rail system, you need some rails. And, and where do you go to buy precision metal rails for your precision camera? Home Depot. <laughs> so, so I got some shower curtain rails. And uh, I was like, well, these seem pretty straight. Well, curved, but precise. And uh, the reason I got curved rails was because I was thinking about the, the notion of a focal point. So what is, should the focal point of an image be? When you look in, like, through a window, you're kind of like looking like 
to a focal point, right? And if you just go parallel, it kind of does something different. And so I did some proof of concepts with uh, a, it's basically a horizontal slider and decided to go with the camera row, which turned out to be a real pain in the ass because there are so many things that I had to solve that were different that hadn't been done like this. And I didn't really know about a lot about how this all worked. So everything from how to attach the rails together and make sure they're like vertically stacked just right so that if I made some bearings slide along, they would slide accurately and precisely. Uh, using the wrong design tools to design the carriage that rolls back and forth. So this is Cinema 4D, which is typically used for VFX, not for uh, manifold 3D modeling, uh, but I made do with the tools that I knew and was able to make some uh, carriage components here. So here you can see uh, some iteration on the carriage that slides along the rail. <clears throat> on the right, you can see I sort of have the, like I'm using the red filament actually as the bearing uh, catch. Uh, and then over here instead, I'm using some uh, nylon washers to have a bit more, um, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, less friction. <clears throat> and so the carriage would roll along the rail like that and uh, basically be driven back and forth uh, by a belt system, as you do with most linear rails. But since it's a curved rail, I had to sort of invent my own rail system, which was a, another real tricky thing to figure out. Uh, but basically, the, the rail, uh, the belt rail slid in between the two shower curtain things there, and I could tune the thickness using some pieces of cardstock. So really high tech, right? I'm like, this camera is going to be terrible. Uh, and uh, obviously you want to use a DC motor because that's completely precise and accurate, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just interested in uh, this idea of capturing from multiple angles. And so you probably ask yourself, and I know now, maybe I should have used some more precision like RC, you know, system or an O drive or something that didn't exist back then. But, you know, I was using a DC motor, trying, using the tools that I knew. And what kind of sensor should I use? How should I capture the images? Um, well, I wanted to be able to capture in the frame of mind of the bullet time idea, right? Capture high speed. And so I used a GoPro Hero 4 that could do 120 frames a second. And the concept here was to, you know, slide it really fast and freeze time, because I was kind of in this like bullet time way of thinking. Um, and I used Adafruit components with Arduino to connect with Wi Fi. That was also really hard to do because I'm not really a programmer. So lots of learning here. And I ended up with this system here. So you have a uh, GoPro sitting on top of the carriage that slides along the curved rail that hopefully stays straight. Straight but curved, aligned. Um, OK, well, how does this work in practice? And I got it working, and I was really proud of it. And it's, it's kind of a, a death machine camera. Uh, it goes really fast, and it captures 120 frames a second. But uh, one time, I, got, I put my finger inside one of those little holes on the rail, and it went at the same time, and like that really hurt. So it's a little bit dangerous. Do not, do not recommend. Um, and then also, this is, a, this is slowed down. And you can see the amount of shake that's happening here, right? It's like wobbly, wobbly, wobbly. And it's not really kind of staying level. So. I did some tests. This is my wife, Sophie. She spoke earlier. She's awesome, doing with one of her wearable projects. And you can see that it's really wobbly and shaky and really not ideal. So I, I spent a whole lot of time going down the rabbit hole of stabilization and uh, um, uh, using kind of different types of, was it durometers of material to try to stop it from like, you know, bouncing around like that and remove the shake. And I used everything like, I'm, I'm obviously not from the right world to be figuring this stuff out. Like, these are earplugs. That's like household weather stripping. This is like packing foam. So I think on the right there is actually some proper like shock absorber, like 50 durometer stuff. Um, even uh, looking at like drone um, uh, stabilization techniques there. So after a lot of experimenting with stuff I knew nothing about, I was able to make it slide pretty smooth, like removed a lot of the shake. But what you'll notice is that it still kind of like dips down in the middle, right? Like as it's sliding back and forth, it's not staying level, it's not staying horizontal. And I still had in my mind 3D image pairs. So I wanted to pair up kind of like the 3D camera, the, the, the film one. I wanted to pair up alternating frames so that when you viewed this in VR or AR, 
it would actually show you, you know, stereoscopic images. But since the stereo pairs were going to be lopsided, since it's not staying level, well, this was all a wash. I decided to like get rid of all of this work and kind of start over. And this was a big learning for me. And what I did was actually found a camera that was more suited to the task. And so this is a Fujifilm W3 uh, stereo camera that has two sensors built on it. And so the idea here was to just capture in stereo natively so that when I played it back, it would actually be nice working stereo pairs. And this is the type of image, uh, this is the kind of image that that one takes. And it's really fun to see all of the mid-air water splashes. Super cute dog and uh, cool space stuff. Um, the problem was, is just like the uh, GoPro, I didn't know how to make it trigger easily. So that was a whole rabbit hole of, of trying to figure out how to hack and reverse engineer this consumer camera. They're hard to come by, and I had to basically take it apart and do some stuff with voltages and traces that also was very foreign to me. And you can see my, I think it's like a spark fun board here that I'm trying to figure out. But I was able to get it to trigger. So I was able to remotely trigger this camera. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So I got my uh, test rig going here. I got a little table dolly with a stepper motor pushing the wheel and capturing lots of frames. And it actually worked really well. So I was like, Shh, this is awesome. This is going to work. So I can like, start to figure out how to change my, my rail system to accommodate this uh, new design, this new element. So I switched from a DC motor to a stepper, figured out how to drive it with an easy driver board uh, attached to the Arduino. In a lot of ways, this reduced the complexity of having to control a GoPro, because a GoPro is not made to do this. And so I could have a lot more discrete control, as I'm sure you're aware of. And then just simple things like being able to catch the um, being able to catch the, uh, the carriage at either end so that it's not you know, just sliding around when I'm hand-holding it, um, adding a screen in the back so that I could have some UI to control the exposure time and um, how many pictures it's taking. So all of this stuff needed to go into a housing because I did want it to be portable, and it seemed to be uh, working out in terms of the, the capture. So you know, super lo-fi prototyping with cardboard, cutting out of wood, uh, some different wood layers here to, to make into a frame. So obviously not the most lightweight thing, but it's the, the tools that I had available and the tools that I knew how to use in the shop. Um, how to make uh, a curved back to this uh, camera was also a challenge. So I actually did some like dado-like slicing in the wood so I could curve it. Of course, they didn't have a dado blade, so this was all just like manual multiple cuts, uh, which let me bend that over the back of the camera and make a nice, uh, nice case for it. So this is kind of where it ended up in terms of the basic build. So wooden housing, you've got the shower curtain rail with a uh, stereo camera sliding around. Give it a coat of paint. This is the basic idea here. Pop that in there, plug it into the hack, hacked camera and it slides back and forth and captures, actually captures video as it goes back and forth. And so it's getting about 100 stereo pair frames as it's going back and forth. Uh, so this is the, the final build here. And you know, definitely portability was important to me because I wanted to go out and shoot. So this is out in the field and it can sit on a tripod so I can actually carry it. Uh, it is a bit bulky, but uh, you know, it is technically portable. Uh, out in Seattle at Volunteer Park shooting. And so this is the type of stereo pairs that it, the camera captures. Uh, so this is um, just a still, just a side by side. And this is what it looks like when it's capturing the, the sequence. So it's basically you know, capturing video and every one of those frames is uh, unique stereo pairs. So when you're wearing one of these or a VR headset, uh, this is kind of what it feels like um, in terms of like looking at it with your eyes. And it's really hard to convey what this feels like. It's like trying to explain to someone what a 360 image in VR looks like because you're in it. Well, this is like looking through a window. And as you move back and forth, you're looking with stereo inside a portal, basically. So it's kind of like a portal photograph. And uh, I was pretty stoked with like how it came out. And it, 
in a lot of ways it was technically imperfect, but it really satisfied my desire to make this kind of uh, immersive camera that was about framing a subject and providing depth and like looking into an image. So, so, so goal achieved uh, after about a year of, of a lot of mistakes. Uh, this is a lot of my learning here. So this is all the prototype parts that I used when uh, producing this. And uh, lots of 3D printing on a MakerBot 2X. Uh, lots of learning about uh, different subsystems of the camera and how they did and didn't work. So this was really interesting, but it's also just as unapproachable as the, um, the 360 stuff if you don't have a headset on. So I was thinking about, like, what if you took this concept and applied it to technology that's available today, right? Like, what do we have in our pockets? We have phones. So what if you made a phone that instead of a single light sensor, like a, a lens that's circular, imagine if this strip across the back of a phone is actually some kind of new optics that can capture multiple points of light across like a strip. And so taking the, the idea and conceptually applying it to what that could be as a new type of sensor that doesn't exist yet. Um, so, you know, wanted it to be handheld and just look like a regular phone. And so this is just made out of acrylic and um, a lot of sanding and, and polishing and some laser cutting. And I just, uh, I, it, this technology is roughly called light field technology where you're basically capturing light from multiple angles. Uh, so there's a company, Lytro, that actually has uh, been doing a lot of work in this space uh, around light field technology and light field cameras. So this was sort of like, okay, I pulled off the 2D 2D immersive framed image, uh, but it was bothering me that you could only move left and right to look through the window, but what if you like moved up and down, right? Like I see, diff I see different things when I move up and down as well. So I started sketching ideas around a 2D rail system to do the same thing and then looking at uh, how to build that. So this is uh, basically a CNC uh, machine, uh, but I was calling it the creative CNC. So using it as a creative tool instead of a machining tool and basically putting a camera inside there so it can capture all of the X and Y coordinates of a plane so that any move that you make when you're viewing the image will show you the right um, coordinates. So this, was, uh, this is not finished yet, this is still in progress, and obviously uh, probably not technically the most sound uh, build because there's a single Z-axis rail and there's a lot of weight on the front, but it, it, did, it does work and it's getting there, and I'll be replacing all of the laser cut wood with uh, aluminum and probably adding uh, extra, extra rails. So I really like this idea because it touches on a specific science fiction film that I, that I like. I'm actually wearing a Blade Runner shirt today, and we, we've probably all talked about the, the enhanced moment of uh, Blade Runner where the camera is like looking behind things and around things. And actually that's totally possible with this, if this camera you know, got built, because you'd actually get image data from lots of different places, right? So um, I like to think that uh, you know, I was able to do this like enhance Blade Runner moment with this, with this camera. So, uh, and I think it's the November 2019 is when Blade Runner happens. So it's, I, f I think it's kind of appropriate for, for today's Supercon. So um, that's about exploring, capturing a framed image with immersion. Uh, but I was also continuing to think about like, what if you wanted to do 360 captures, but instead of it just being a flat bubble, you wanted to have 3D, and maybe you wanted to, the camera person to be not in the frame. So one of the things that's a problem right now is uh, someone who's capturing a 360 image, they'll be in the image if the camera's on a tripod. So they all have to like run behind things and like hide. Uh, whenever they want to capture something. So uh, my wife was working on something, some wearable projects, and we were going to go to the Seattle Maker Faire. So uh, I made uh, this fun concept headset here where you are the camera person, you're capturing a 360 image, and you're also wearing a, uh, basically an AR visor that lets you see you know, the, uh, the content that you capture. So it's kind of an all-in-one package. And you know, just like the, the rail system, uh, you know, go high tech or go home. This is an uh, embroidery hoop um, with uh, Circuit Playground Express to power some lights. Basically, they're not sensors, they're just lights. Um, and this is uh, some LEDs just around an embroidery hoop and make it look cool. And so I was, I was a little bit like, 
am I kind of crazy? This is like a totally crazy idea, right? Um, but apparently I'm not the craziest person. Uh, so <laughs> this is uh, from Jesus VR, the film Jesus, when they did the VR version, and he's got a Galaxy VR thing that he's looking at the content through that's captured with this in kind of crazy, like, I think it's a military helmet with some cameras strapped to it. And this is an interesting uh, version from like the, from the 80s, maybe? Don't know where that came from. But this is not so far-fetched. There's actually a lot of products on the market that are 360 camera solutions uh, from Sam Samsung, uh, from China, from Yi, and uh, this uh, kind of weird hexagonal one over here. But they're all trying to capture 360 images. And that extends to like full 360, like up and down, left and right, all around. And these allow you to capture uh, stereo pairs. So you've got 3D vision, but 360 as well. So what about the crazy CNC camera that I built? Well, that's not, not so far-fetched either. Uh, Lytro has actually been building these concept cameras, and this is uh, a huge uh, machine from Lytro. That's a planoptic, planoptic camera that has a whole bunch of lenses that it captures images from each of those lenses separately to create the light field that lets you basically capture lots of angles instead of just one. Even Adobe's uh, played around with this, the, the company that I work for with these different cameras that do multi-optic imaging. You can actually buy these in the store. This is the Light L16, which is a camera that has 16 sensors on it. So this is all still, you know, like optical image capture, right? It's just capturing the image and something that you can play back in a device. Uh, but what about new ways to capture uh, such as um, uh, Microsoft here is doing reality capture where they're actually digitizing what they're capturing with all these cameras and they're converting it into digital. So this is what you get out of it. You get these, you know, kind of low poly but still really interesting like 3D recordings. Uh, Matterport is doing it for real estate. So they're scanning entire buildings or homes and something that you can like jump around in in VR. And, uh, you know, when you're wearing the headset, uh, you can, you know, be in there. Now, all of this data is pretty heavy. There's so much data, right? Like, it's like really, really high polygon. There's a lot of textures, a lot of information. Headsets are getting high resolution. This is an 8K VR headset. Looks pretty rad, yo. Um, and then we've got rendering quality is going up. People expect, like, really high quality renders, and they don't want to be looking at cartoony stuff anymore. So that's a challenge. And so the compute needs is just like skyrocketing if you want good quality immersion. And so it's interesting to think about like what is gonna be needed from computing to really drive this. We have GPUs that are getting faster and faster and are able to keep up with what we can output today. But I think something like extreme ultraviolet lithography, uh, when they bring down like the nanometers of like etching the, the silicon, uh, will really like give a huge boost to, to some of this immers immersive tech. And maybe even this type of like nanoscale technology will let us to create um, new optics uh, like the light field mobile camera where you um, are capturing not with a big you know, round sensor but actually kind of uh, like a diffraction grading almost. Okay, so you're in the VR and you're like immersed in this like 3D space. Well, you want to walk around, right? So now you're capturing and you want to, you're in the image instead of seeing the image and you want to walk around, you want to, touch the wall. Well, how do you touch the wall? Well, there's these vests, like the haptics vest, the null space VR vest, is, um, which gives you some senses. Like if you're in a game, you can like get shot and feel the hits. Well, that's only one part of your body, but what if you want to touch an object in that virtual world? Now you're like engaging with the virtual stuff. Well, you've got companies like Dextra Robotics that let you have this force feedback glove while you're wearing the headsets and also uh, haptics as well as is playing with that it lets you feel things like you know objects in your hand um, so you're like you're like in this place and like you're in vr but you still react like a real person right so in this next one a bus is coming at this lady and she's like holy shit and she like plows into the wall in the, in the demo space, right? Like that sucks. Like, okay, so how do we solve the locomotion problem in VR? Well, this is not new. This is like from the 80s and it's just reimagined for today. And it's these fancy treadmills and you're like treadmilling around like at the arcade, right? And that's cool, but like it's only flat. What if I want to move up and down? Well, you've got these crazy experiments where you can like go up a step with this wild like step lifter thing, right? Okay, so obviously, 
it's really difficult to like get around in VR. You're like you're stuck on one level. You can't really touch things. You can't really feel things that well. I mean, pretty soon you're like in this kind of thing, <laughs> and you're like, what is this Ready Player One dystopian future that we're in? So pretty soon you're like here, and you're wearing some skull cap, and it's like sending signals to your brain. And Valve has even been playing with this. This is an experimental headset. And like pretty soon, you're like in this, <laughs> you're like in this world, right? And you're like, oh shit, this is not the future that I wanted. Like, whoa, like, oh, hold on a second. Like, the Matrix is not what we wanted to do right here. You know, like this is not what we expected. So, you know, I like to look at this and laugh because palm are lucky, um, face palm. But when it comes down to it, none of you here probably has a headset on you. We have these things, right? in our pockets, and we have these things in our bags, and we look at these things at home, and they're all flat, and they're all 2D. That's the technology that exists today. So how do we make the rectangles more immersive, less flat? Well, we're getting there, and there's the uh, cool looking glass display. This is a 4K um, uh, holographic display that you can actually look at from different angles, and it's stereoscopic 3D. So very much bringing that immersive feel to a rectangle. And some of the 3D technology, the 360 technology, is being used for more approachable purposes today. So this is the Insta360 ONE X that captures 360 in 4K or maybe 6K and actually takes from that a 1080p stabilized tracked image that you can use for your you know, YouTube or for your family images or pet videos. So it's basically extracting useful 2D stuff out of a 360 sphere. And we're seeing more and more lenses appear on cameras, I mean on uh, phones. So the Xiaomi Note 10 that just got announced has five. So we're starting to see, see more and more lenses, more and more uh, depth perception. Uh, many people might have this, and you have this uh, three-lensed monstrosity on the, on the iPhone. And what's really cool is that, you know, you've got... You're, we're starting to ease into this sort of immersive future where we're using machine learning and algorithms to infer depth. We've got depth sensors on some camera, on some phones, and we're able to do a lot of like in-camera processing. Uh, the Google Pixel does amazing stuff with night sight and it, it being able to capture in low light conditions. And so when it really comes down to it, the, the immersive cameras of the future may not be that far away, but they're also kind of difficult to figure out and so 10-year-old me is pretty excited about what we have in our pockets and the camera tech that we have today. And so I think I would like to wrap up by taking a picture, because I think that's appropriate. I'll just take a little selfie here with everyone. Woo. Without dropping it. Woo! Thank you.